The video you're about to see is a recording of a lecture given by Dr. Tracy Voles, a nationally recognized expert in communication education from Rice University. As you watch her lecture, it's important to note not only what she presents, but how she presents it. Try to recognize the ways that she uses her own suggestions and techniques to give a more effective presentation. By taking the advice that Dr. Voles provides, you'll find that you can become a more effective communicator and a more successful engineer. Dr. Satterbeck and I traveled to a conference several years ago where we encountered someone by the name of Neil Lerner, who was, at the time was on faculty at MIT. And he said something that I have never forgotten. And this was years ago. He said, an engineer who can't communicate works for one who can. As an engineer, it's imperative that you become skilled at expressing your ideas clearly and precisely and persuasively. You will need those skills when you attempt to express your ideas and convince people on your team that you have a suggestion that's worth pursuing you will need those skills to get a job. You will need those skills to get promoted, to get funding and resources to support something you want to do, and even in some cases to call attention to a really serious problem that could have deleterious effects on a population of people as an engineer. You can never be too good at communicating. And it's, I know that some of you are coming into this class very accomplished at giving presentations. But some of you may have shied away in the past from giving talks because it's something that makes you feel uncomfortable, that you're going to be put on the spot and judged. Now is the time for you to not only develop skills that you may not yet possess, or to refine skills that you have and take them to the next level. Because I would like all of you to leave Rice as high impact presenters. So what is it that high impact presenters do? They do five things, and I'm gonna cover all five of these in the next hour. First, they develop a communication strategy, and that's related to audience and purpose and context. They organize an argument, as you pointed out a moment ago. That's so crucial. They convey confidence through their delivery. They integrate slides to supplement the message, right? to enhance the message, to emphasize the message, not as some kind of script or some kind of crutch. And last, they handle the questions with ease. So let's take strategy first. Strategy, as I said, is a function of purpose, audience, and context. When you're giving a technical talk, you usually have multiple purposes working at once. You're trying to engage people's interest, get them to actually pay attention. You're informing them. You're persuading them that your ideas are valuable. You might be establishing your credibility demonstrating that you possess the competence and the skills to achieve what you set out to do. These are high level objectives for a talk. And I want you to think much more concretely about your objectives because I promise you, if you do this, you will save yourself and your team a ton of time in the preparation phase. So here's what you need to do to save that time. Answer three questions as a team before you start building that argument. The first one, when our presentation is over, I want the audience to remember blank. And you should have about three key points. What do you want people to remember? Second question. When I'm done speaking, I want the audience to do what? What action do you want them to take? 
And third, when I'm through speaking, how do you want the audience to feel? How do you want the audience to feel? And you might be thinking, oh, really? This is a technical talk in a class? Feelings? I sometimes see some eye rolling when I mention this. But the reason that feelings are important, the reason you need to connect with people, either to get them enthusiastic about your idea, to, to generate a sense of concern or anger about a problem that exists in the world, because emotions drive actions. So you need to think in advance about what your key points are, what do you want people to do when you're done, and how are you going to get them to do that based on the way you leave them feeling at the end of your talk. If you work on those three questions, you will not make 65 slides to show in a 13-minute talk because you will be able to narrow down your message much more efficiently and spend more time focused on the key points instead of extraneous material. You also have to keep in mind who your audience is. What are their backgrounds? What do they already know about your topic? Why should they care? What are their yes but questions that you need to take on? I'll give you one example of a way in which criteria influences decision making. So a few years ago, I was coaching a chemical engineering student here at Rice who'd done an internship at an oil and gas firm over the summer. At the end of the summer, he needed to give a presentation about what he had contributed over the course of the summer. He was very excited to share with his manager and his department this innovation he had introduced in one of their core chemical processes. And he had done this in a lab, right? It hadn't been scaled up to an industry level uh, application. But he had proof of concept. So he was going to present this at the end of the summer. And he came in, and he hit us right up front in the practice session with this idea, this innovation. And I said, tell me about the primary decision maker in the room. Tell me about your manager. And he said, oh, all summer it's been a struggle to get, this, to get my manager to let me do this because my manager tends to be really compliant and conservative in his thinking, and he's worried that, you know, if I use this special innovation in our process, it's going to mess up things downstream. And I said, knowing that, do you think that it's an effective strategy to lead with the innovation? What do you all think about that? Does that seem like a good idea? I see some heads nodding no. Right, because if you lead with something that someone is resistant to, they're likely to become even more resistant and potentially tune out. So that's a situation where the intern could still talk about the innovation, but the way that it was situated in terms of context and argument needed to be adjusted. He needed to lead with some research that showed that the kind of innovation he had developed was already, it had already been published in the literature elsewhere, and he had taken that process and made some adjustments that were unique to his particular application. Then, when he got to the part about that innovation, the manager would feel much more comfortable. So think carefully about your audience and the criteria they use. In engineering, they use a lot of criteria. Safety, innovation, economics. There are many criteria to keep in mind when you're thinking about how to pitch your design. In a short talk, three or four key points is about all you can successfully convey. And in a proposal talk, these are the questions that your audience expects you to answer. What's the motivation for the work? Why is it necessary in the first place? What particular problem are you working on? What engineering problem are you tackling? This can be different from the motivation. What does the design space look like? What's the state of the art? And in a design talk, you 
only say a few words about the state of the art and you emphasize why it is inadequate to build up the need for your solution. What are your criteria? And these need to be quantitative. Don't get dinged on your presentation because you failed to use quantitative design criteria. In your brainstorming sessions, what kinds of things did you consider? Again, you can't spend a lot of time on that if you only have 13 minutes. Instead, you need to focus more on which solution you're moving forward with and what the features are. Dr. Satterbeck mentioned early on to talk about what the features are and how it works. Something that she didn't say that I can tell you after grading with her for many years is that you need to justify the decisions. Say why you're doing what you're doing. That's most important to engineering arguments. Why are you doing, what's the basis for a decision? Did you just randomly choose something? Is it based on research? Is it based on testing? What's the basis for your design decisions? What are your plans or your timeline for going forward? And last, and it's not up here, what are the implications or the benefits of your particular solution? What's its impact going to be? And sometimes when you're wrapping up, you want to tie the impact back to the motivation that you started out with. So those are the key questions people will expect you to answer. But once you have answers to those questions, you got to think about how to organize information. And two strategies that are common in practice sessions that are hard to pull off effectively are chronological narratives and inductive. So chronology is essentially a sequential narrative. Let me show you an example of what that looks like in an NG120 talk. Take a look at this slide. You'll notice if you bother to read all this text that it leads off with, oh, we had a deadline of three weeks and we were using Mindstorm kits and we split the arm into components and then we did this and then we did that, right? This is chronology. This is the team reproducing their design process. And as a listener, one, some of that information isn't something that we necessarily highly value. And two, it's not the best way for the audience to organize information about a design, the way that the process was completed. Do any of you know what inductive organization is? You know what that means, basically? Because that's the other common approach. It's even more common than this chronological approach. You familiar with inductive logic? Cause and effect is a little bit different. It can be inductive. Inductive is essentially the suspense novel approach to an argument. It's when you start with the details and you build up to the key point. So you can apply it to a cause effect argument but it's starting with the details or the evidence and building up to the main claim. Let me show you how this plays out in a design presentation. Team of bioengineers trying to pitch a technology they developed to venture capitalists showed up to practice. And the first presenter of a two-person team leads off with, today we're going to talk about nanomedicine which, by the way, is this huge area of research. Let's begin with some background about nanoshells. And he proceeds to show a series of slides, definition slides about nanoshells, how they're synthesized, the key properties, such as being biocompatible, they have tunable wavelengths, which is useful. He shows some data that proves that point. Our team is also working with a hydrogel polymer, and they show the chemical formula for the polymer. They show that it's biocompatible. Do you know what their cool device is? No. And it continues. We're coating the nanoshells with the polymer. This is the way our system behaves. They're showing data now. We are way into this talk. Venture capitalists would be long gone by now. If you've ever watched Shark Tank, you know. 
There's very little patience for this kind of structure. We still don't know, right, right here, right here, we're at the end, I'm practicing with them. Our team is coding nanoshells with this polymer to deliver insulin in diabetes patients in a non-invasive way. I was like, wow, that's awesome. Why didn't you tell me that 13 minutes ago? Why? Because by not telling me that 13 minutes ago, it meant that I and you sitting there just now had to hold information in your head about nanoshells and about the polymer and about the behavior and you don't know why. And that puts a burden on the audience in terms of cognitive load when we don't know where things are going. So I got two answers. One person on the team said, well, we didn't actually think you'd listen if we told you up front what we're doing. We needed some suspense. I was like, you lost me because I didn't care. And second, another person said something that resonated with me, and that is that we, we didn't actually think you would understand our technology unless we sort of gave you the building blocks or the fundamental pieces that help produce it or enable it. I can understand why they might think that. That replicates their own process again. But as a listener, it doesn't work very effectively in most cases. Western North Americans generally prefer deductive logic. If you have ever picked up a 150 page grant or report, you know there's an executive summary on the, on the front, in the front. Why? Because we'd like to know whether or not we need to delve into 150 pages to find information we're looking for. Research articles have abstracts. Right? You state your thesis at the end of the introduction. You need to replicate that kind of logic when you're giving a talk. So let's talk about what that looks like. It's deductive. Think deductive direct. In this case, first of all, they didn't lead off with any kind of motivation. Remember, let me give you some background about nanoshells. Oh, yay. They need to lead off with motivation. 20 million people in the US suffer from diabetes. Not managing that condition leads to all kinds of health problems, which the presenter would elaborate on in a little bit of detail. There are economic costs associated with not managing diabetes. And talk about what those are, right? You set up the motivation. Why do we need a new solution? That's the motivation. Then we have to dive down into the problem. The problem with the existing approach is that many people who have diabetes use insulin injections, right? That's not, that's not pleasant, right? Needle pricks are, are painful, creates biohazardous waste, makes it harder to travel and remember. Another strategy to managing diabetes is insulin pumps, which can be challenging for children and elderly people to use. And as a result, we see that these chronic conditions have long-term negative effects on individuals' health and quality of life which is why our team has developed a new solution. We're coating nanoshells with a hydrogel polymer to deliver insulin in a non-invasive way. And in this talk, we're going to share some information about nanoshells, the polymer we selected, and show you some preliminary data that looks very promising. And it's gonna radically improve diabetes care for millions of Americans. Do you hear that? At that point on, the rest of the talk is the same. But that's deductive logic relative to inductive. Do you see the difference? Motivation, signal key point early, forecast where you're going. And then emphasize it again at the end. And there's a reason that you want to organize deductively. Think about your experience watching a 20 minute research talk. Let's assume that the presenter provides some motivation 
to engage your interest up front. What happens to our attention from minute, say, zero to three? It goes up, right? We show up hoping to get some value for our time and learn something. If they deliver on that expectation with some motivation, it goes up. What happens from three to 18? So I see this kind of exponential decline off the cliff gesture over here. What research shows is that it's more like a series of peaks and valleys, that audiences tend to tune in for key points and section transitions, and then they tune out for details, and they tune back in for a key point, and then they tune out for details. And then if the speaker is smart enough to send a cue, in conclusion, what do we all do? Right, we all pay attention. It's like, oh, thank God, it's almost over. She's going to tell me what matters. I should pay attention right now. And sure enough, we see a spike in people's attention. So what this cartoon illustrates is that there are two times when people are most likely to be listening, and that's at the beginning and at the end. So you want to start strong. And I've also I've already mentioned several of the features of a strong introduction. I do want to point out that I generally encourage students to memorize the first couple of sentences that he or she plans to say. I don't think memorization is a good strategy in general, but when you step up to address an audience, you don't want to step up and then scramble to figure out what to say first, because when people do that, it usually comes out like this. Uh, hi, I'm Tracy Voles. I'm from Martell. And I'm going to talk about our team's design project. Right? That's not a good way to start. It's OK to introduce yourself, but not like that. So craft a good, a good introduction. Don't lead off with an apology. Don't get up and say, oh, we've really had a hard time meeting with our clients, so we don't really have any data to show about our solution. You got to go with what you got. You want to be clear and persuasive and go with what you got. Today, I'm going to talk about. That's not a good opening sentence. You can do better than that. Now I'm going to show you an example of a 120 student who did better than that. This is Alex Nunez Thompson. Do any of you know him? All right. So Alex was presenting on behalf of his 120 team. And I want you to, to pay attention to two things in this clip. I want you to think about what he does to engage your interest in his team's design problem and what he does to establish his credibility. How do you know you can trust him? The members of my group here today are Kyle Giovini, Nuwan Haraf, Robert Godivo, and Michael Saad. And today we've been working in conjunction with Rice University, the Rice Center for Engineering Leadership, and the Shell Corporation to bring you this presentation. So as I begin, I want you to take a look at these two bottles of water. Now, can you tell me the obvious difference between these two? Yeah. So for those of you that can't see the back, I have a bottle of, that's clearly dirty water and a bottle of clear water. Now, Michael, if I had have asked you before this presentation started which one you would rather drink, how would you have responded? The clear water. If I had have asked anyone in this room which water they would have rather drank, they probably would have picked the clear bottle. It seems like an obvious choice. But what you may not know is contained inside of this water, there could be thousands of hydrocarbons that, when ingested, could have such adverse health effects as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, liver failure, and can ultimately result in your death. Now, hydrocarbons are the primary constituents of gas stations. So, all around the world, gas stations run the risk of these harmful contaminants seeping deep into the groundwater. Now, what's the big deal about this? Well, humans actually use about 80% of all of our drinking water. It all comes from the ground. So that means that somebody that has their very own well attached to their house for their drinking water, they could be pulling up these harmful contaminants, essentially putting them at risk. So that's why corporations such as Shell have to go to these stations, they have to dig deep into the underground, and they have to extract anywhere from 9 to 10 gallons of water. They then take only a very small sample of this and send it off to a lab to be tested for hydrocarbons. But what about the other 9 to 10 gallons? Well, that has to be contained, transported off-site to a treatment facility, whether or not there are any contaminants in it, and it has to undergo extensive treatment, which is costly and inefficient. So what we've done is we've created a goal to create a cost-effective on-site treatment system that will both filter out the hydrocarbons and safely evaporate the water. 
So what did Alex do to engage your interest in his team's project? How did he hook you? Yes? Did you give an example that was uh, personal and affected the audience directly? The example of the water? Right. It was something you could relate to. And he personalized it by asking an individual or two individuals in the class. And something else about that particular example made it especially effective. And that is that he used a strategy called dissonance. Dissonance is a fancy way of saying myth-busting. Right? He held up the clear water, and the obvious choice is to choose to drink the clear water. But what did he say? He's like, oh, actually, you wouldn't want to drink this clear water because it could be loaded with hydrocarbons. Right? He, he defied our expectation or our assumption. That gets people's attention. He also led with a question. That right away gets people thinking about answers. Like those are some good strategies to start off. What made you think you could trust him? The very beginning he said who he was working with, so Rice, Arcel, and Shell. From the, at the outset, he introduced himself and mentioned his partners. That enhanced his credibility. He also used a couple of specific facts or data to support some of the claims he was making, which suggests he knew what he was talking about. What about his demeanor? What did you think of his demeanor? His style? Yeah? He was really like, relatable. He wasn't like, all super formal to try to relate to the audience. He appeared relatable, like somebody who wanted to, who took the audience seriously. He seemed genuine, enthusiastic. He seemed prepared and confident. Yeah. So this is one example of an introduction from NG120. You don't all have to mimic Alex's style, but do think carefully about how you're going to motivate interest and how you're going to establish your credibility. You may not have his same style. You may not be quite as exuberant as he was. But it doesn't mean you'll be any less effective, but you want to play to your strengths. You not only want to start strong, but you got to end strong. Remember that cartoon when people are paying attention? Memorize the final sentence you plan to say so you know what it is and you know when it's coming. Send a cue so that people pay attention and tune in. Restate those key points and tease out the implications of your ideas or your solution. What benefit will it provide? A few things not to do. I don't want you to accelerate the rate as you near the conclusion and come to a full stop and shrug your shoulders and say, uh, that's it. Or that's all I have for you. That is a weak way to end. And I'm going to tell you why that happens. Let's assume the speaker did memorize the last sentence. Sometimes they don't do that. So they're winging it as they go. And they don't actually know when they're done. But even somebody who's prepared, if you don't carefully manage the rate at the end and slow down and bring your voice down on that last word, the audience will not pick up the oral cue that you're ending. So they will still be staring expectantly at you because you were talking fast, thinking you're going to say something else. And there will be this awkward exchange where you're looking out and they're looking at you expectantly and you realize you have to essentially announce that you have nothing else to say. And that's how we get the that's it moment. Don't let that be you. Try not to end with hopefully our design will work. Engineering is about analysis and testing and planning and iteration. There's a little bit of hope involved, but it's about skills. So emphasize your confidence that what you're proposing will work, not hope that it will. And no question slide. How many of you have seen the question slide? It's pretty ubiquitous. This is rhetorically not a smart move. I know you see it in a lot of places. I do too. 
It's not a smart thing to do. Here's why. In an oral presentation, the audience is usually tracking a little bit behind the speaker. Right? We're taking in, as an audience member, new knowledge. We're comparing it to prior knowledge. We're thinking of concrete examples. We are thinking of counter arguments. We are a little bit behind the speaker. So we get to the end of the talk. The speaker concludes he's or she's transitioning to the Q&A the goal of which is to facilitate conversation. And instead of leaving up a slide that is substantive or relevant, they snatch that away and put up something like this. This is not helpful. This is not helpful. You have some options as a speaker. You can leave your conclusion slide up. For the Q&A, you can put up a relevant image or a schematic of your design. You can put up a quote. Think about what is going to be powerful and support the audience in formulating questions. If you don't want to do any of those things, then just go to black and have the attention on you. But you don't need this. This is not helping. When you put up a slide like this as a speaker, the you're deferring to your own slide. Your slide is suddenly asking for questions. You need to ask, and you need to be in control. Don't overload your conclusion slide with a ton of words, because when you do that, people read. And that means right in the moment when you're most invested in heightening the emotional connection with the audience, you lost them, because they can't read your slide and listen to you at the same time. You do need to include an acknowledgement slide. Alex, in the previous video clip, acknowledged some of his support at the outset. You can also acknowledge support you've received at the end. If you leave this for the end, again, this is not a great thing to leave up for the Q&A. So you'll want to have something follow this that is useful for the Q&A. If you have a long list of people who have helped you, you can list them on the slide, but do not read each person's name individually. Think about ways to group individuals into classes and refer to the slide, but don't read every single person's name because it diffuses the energy as you're closing. The last point I want to make about argument has to do with transitions, and this is important. For me, the difference between a good talk and a great talk is often in the quality of the transitions. Transitions provide the logical glue for the audience. They connect the points, the dots. What I see frequently happen is that a team or a student will design a deck of slides and it's it represents all kinds of implicit logic. Right? You have thought, as the designer of that deck, about the sequence of information from one slide to the next. You've thought about the sequence of information on a particular slide. It's all there in your head. But what very few speakers do is make that logic explicit for the audience. And they fall into those weak cues that you see listed on the left. And another thing, so results. In addition, next, that's not helpful. So as a final step in your preparation, take the time to write out the transitions from slide to slide. It will make a huge difference. And in the act of doing that, you may discover that the order that you thought would work doesn't actually yield smooth segues from one point to the next. And you have the opportunity at that juncture to rearrange information. Whereas if you don't go that extra step, you get up here in the front, and I bet you've seen talks where people are going forwards and backwards through their slides because things aren't in the order that they actually need to be in to explain something clearly. Figure that out in advance by writing out transitions. So at this point, we've talked about the way in which high impact presenters develop a strategy and organize an argument. And now I'm gonna have you guys transition to thinking about your delivery of the message. Because what 
our studies show in communication is that audiences are more likely to remember your style. They're likely to remember more about your facial expressions, your tone of voice, the way you use your hands, than your key points. Over 85% of what audiences recall has to do with delivery. That's a huge number. A study just came out of presentations that were evaluated by funding agents, both government funding agencies and venture capitalists. And just by watching video clips and listening to the voice quality and the gestures, they made decisions about funding. It was a published paper, a really important study. I can't emphasize this enough, how important it is that you generate a professional, effective ethos when you're interacting with people. And that's a function of your stance and movement, your eye contact, your voice, and your hands. We've talked about strategy, argument, and delivery. I'm going to quickly transition to some slides about slide design. And I'm going to fly through these examples. Slides should function like billboards. This is the words of my colleague, June Farrell, who retired. One message per slide. And yet, we tend to overload slides with tons of text. Imagine you're driving down 59 and you glance at a billboard and it looks like that. Right? You crash. Or we copy and paste images from documents that have no business on a slide because of the font, because of the complexity. It doesn't work. Don't do that. Because when you do that, this is what you get. Days confused and bored, audience members. Think of slide design as another form of problem solving. That's something you all are very good at. Think about how you're going to use principles of arrangement, visual elements, animation, and your data to make a compelling visual message. Where do your eyes go on this example? The graphics in the middle. And they go there because it's high contrast in terms of color and shape and it's positioned in the center and there's white space around them. It draws your attention. That is not the most important element on this title slide. But that's where your eyes go. So this is poor design. I asked this presenter, do people even know what those things are? Well, no, I just like generated them on my computer. So they're not even meaningful, really. This is a redesign of that slide where the title is much more present, or it draws much more attention than in this example where it just sort of floats off the top. Background should be simple. You don't have to use white. It doesn't have to be plain white, but don't get carried away with busy templates in PowerPoint or Keynote or Prezi. Allow your data to pop, not the template you chose. Text, choose a font that's legible. Use large font sizes, succinct bullets that are short phrases, not full sentences. When you design lists, try to make the items in the list parallel because it aids quick scanning when people are reading your slides. Be conservative in the use of text treatments, such as italics or underlining, and whatever conventions you choose, just apply them consistently. So for slides, we recommend using a sans serif font. There are many to choose from. The reason for that is that in a sans serif font, like those on the left, the shaft of the letter tends to be uniform, which means that when you view it from far away, or if you're standing six feet away from a poster, it's easier to view from a distance than a serif font like those shown on the right, where there are thin parts to the letter and thicker parts. Try not to go below 18 point font when you're designing slides. Use the title bar on the slide to convey information. Don't use a generic placeholder like problem. We could slide a title like that into any one of your team's talks. Try to convey substantive information in that title bar because it frames people's reading of what comes below. This is a lousy slide. What are some of the things that are wrong with this example? Serif, serif font, actually it's got two different kinds of fonts, but yes, a lot of serif. What else? It has false and it's not 
Long sentences, it's not consistently formatted in the capitalization or the punctuation. Too much text. You've read my mind. <laughs> One thing you may not have noticed is that it doesn't have a hanging indent. Again, hanging indents aid scanning. So by that I mean that this A in access should really be underneath the I in it. And if you move the tab on the ruler line when you're designing slides, you'll be able to do that. This is a redesign of that slide. You can see they cut down so much of the text that they actually had room for a picture that shows what telemedicine is. When you're choosing colors, you want to use high contrast colors. They tend to be located across from one another on the color wheel. One exception to that is don't pair red and green. That's not a good combination for those who have red green color blindness. Choose colors that are appropriate for the situation. You can use color for emphasis to highlight something important on a slide. You can use it for coherence. Think carefully about the way you use color so that you don't end up using it like this. Yellow on white is a bad combination. Red and fuchsia on blue is a bad combination. Can you tell that the up and down arrows are color coded in that example? No, because they picked brown and dark blue, which are not high contrast against light blue. Right? These palettes work in combination. If you use CAD drawings in your presentation, they can add a lot of value. But you can't just have gray nondescript blobs, because that doesn't add value. So beware of what I call the 50 shades of gray in your CAD drawings. Visuals that you use need to be high resolution, cropped, so the focal point is clear. If you need scale bars, <coughs> include them. And label things that are important in your images, like you see here. When it comes to displaying data, use a lot of the landscape on a slide for data display. And we'll reinforce this in a talk later in the semester. But don't just plunk four bar charts on one slide. You lose no time at all splitting them up. The only time you should think about putting more than one chart on a slide is if you want to make a direct comparison. Then the audience needs to be able to see both at once. But don't just for the sake of conserving space, plunk all four on one slide. Make sure you've got units and labels. You might be thinking, oh, of course. But you'd be surprised at how many people forget to add in the units and labels, and avoid chart junk. These are the defaults in Excel that automatically dump in a double title. They put in the gray background behind graphs, the grid lines, the outline around graphs. Just go in and change the defaults to create a much cleaner presentation of your data. So here we have an example of a Pew Matrix draft from this course. Notice that the title is not informative. The font is small. The values aren't centered in the cells. We don't know what to look at. It's just a huge table of data. This is a revision of that Pew matrix. And you can see that they've used animation and highlighting as they're talking to direct people's eyes to important aspects of their analysis. This is a lousy bar chart. This PowerPoint's defaults for the bar chart. It's 3D. Do not use 3D unless your data is 3D. It gives you this border automatically. It chooses light blue on white, which is low contrast. When you design a bar chart, the bars should be thicker than the spaces between them so that people's eyes go to the bars. More values than we need on the Y. This is a revision of that same data. And one more quick example before you look at your peers' graphs. Here you see a line graph, and there are all kinds of problems with this. We got the Excel title, the border, two legends, all the things I mentioned as chart junk. They forgot the units. This is a revision of that data. So before, after. I want to wrap up with just a couple of words about Q&A. I got five points, and I'm going to go through them very fast, so don't pack up yet. When the Q&A starts, 
Listen to the whole question. Don't jump in and interrupt the questioner. Be respectful, reflect on the question, and restate or repeat it so that everybody in this room hears it, which is not easy to hear in this room. Second, when you go to answer, lead with the general. Lead with the main point or a thesis. Use that deductive reasoning to answer. That is a very hard skill to master. Lead with the general, not the details. Provide the details after. Watch your body language, because this is what happens in the Q&A. Start watching. And now I'd like to take your questions and comments. People back up. They throw their arms across their chest. Just stay open and approachable. This is a chance for you to elaborate and clarify and recommend. It's a good thing to have a Q&A. It's not something to fear. So don't show your fear by doing this. And then, last, wrap up well. In a Q&A, you can be taken off on some crazy tangents. People can ask off-the-wall questions. And the Q&A is the audience's final impression. So bring people back on message and emphasize your key points at the end. Don't miss that opportunity to drive home your key points so that you leave the impression that you are a high impact presenter. I'm gonna make all these materials available to you through Owlspace. You'll have a chance to practice these skills and I hope that they bring up everybody's performance in this class when you watch the presentations in another week.